left, right, left. I did the Ali shuffle, and then I put him in the head, and then I stopped him. And he was knocked out for 22 and a half minutes. Would you please tell me your name? My name is Nate Johnson. How you doing, Nate? I'm doing well. Why are you here, Nate? Well, I'm here because I have something to say. It's great. Fantastic. Um, we are the voice of the voiceless, and here's your opportunity. Uh, I met you, and I'd like you to tell our family, what do you do currently? All right, so I, I run an organization called Free Writers, which um, is about three years old. What we do at Free Writers is, like the core of what we do is we bring a particular type of mindful writing exercise into the county jails. And the way that it works is that uh, uh, people show up by choice for our classes in mostly in Hennepin County, but also in Anoka County and Wright County. And um, they get paper and pencils and we, we free write, you know, like where we pick random writing prompts, like the day I was born, the day I die, my best friend, my worst enemy, ketchup, mustard, and pickles. It, the prompt doesn't so much matter. Um, and then and then when I say go, all of us, including myself, start writing to a five-minute timer. And it doesn't matter one single bit what anybody writes. But what does matter is that they try to write nonstop for the five minutes. Um, and then at the end of each of those five minutes, anybody who wants to read out loud what he or she just put down is invited to do that. But they don't have to do that. I like to read my stuff out loud. I like to hear what other people have to say, but I respect people who want to keep it quiet. Um, and and the, the, thing that, the thing that I have to say, well, I have many things to say, but one of the things I want to say to you um, is that uh, this project that I've been working on and that I've had some really um, good people help me with <clears throat> is uh, we're starting to take it from inside the county jail system. And I'll get into later, I'll get in more to why it's there's such a, an acute need for this specifically in jails as opposed to prisons. But um, we're starting to stay engaged with the people that we meet in the jail who get out and want to keep doing this free writing. Um, and uh, I, I re <laughs> I'm really excited about where this might go once we get more and more people who've, who we have connected with on the inside who then want to come and write with us on the outside and then perhaps um, lead some of their own free writers classes with the people who they think might benefit. How do you come up? How did you come to free writing? Um, well, I learned, I learned it in a, in a, a creative writing seminar that I took at the loft literary center over on Washington Avenue in Minneapolis. Um, I was out of work. I had quit my job and and had moved back to Minneapolis and um, had a little bit of money saved up. And so I, I'm a writer. I, I've always been a writer um, and a reader, but never really with too much of an objective. I just always wrote in like these 99 cent CVS notebooks, Target notebooks, um, but never really with any purpose. It just felt like I should just always have one of these notebooks with me and then whatever book I'm reading. So anyway, when I had some money and some time, excuse me, um, uh, I saw that there was a five day creative writing seminar at the loft where it was like, like five days, basically all day, like during the work day. So you, you really couldn't do it unless you had, you know, nothing else to do. Um, and it was going to cover uh, like an introduction to poetry, short fiction, and creative nonfiction. And on day one of the class, the teacher, who's a, a wonderful woman named Jory Miller, 
said to us, like, okay, the first thing we're going to do is some free writing. And she said, uh, we're going to pick a writing prompt, same, same as what I do in the jail. Um, and the prompt that she gave us first time through was um, the day I was born. And she said, uh, uh, we're going to write for five minutes, keep your hand moving. And then at the end, we'll read them out loud if you want to. And when she said go and I started writing, um, I was exhilarated. Like, like I had been dealing with some heavy duty depression, even in sobriety. I, I, I had been dealing with like dark shit, like, like, like just right, always right on the edge of hopelessness. Like what is the point, you know? And, and so anyway, this, in this moment, I found that I was kind of getting lost in the middle of this five minute writing. And the place my mind went to was in the hospital in Mankato, January 1, well, December 31, and then January 1, 1979, when I was born. And I'm thinking about, you know, my dad in there and my mom, and they're both like in their mid twenties. They don't know shit, you know, and, uh, and, and I had heard that my dad fainted when I was born. Like he wasn't really built to handle this kind of thing. And, and, uh, and then I started wondering, like, so when they took me outside, like home from the hospital, it must've been cold, you know, and this is like before auto start. So I just thought, you know, uh, my first time out in the world must've just been like sitting in, in whatever kind of car they had waiting for it to warm up in the parking lot out there. And then I started wondering, like, I wonder if these two people who would eventually split, I wonder if the, if their the issues were already there in their marriage. So anyway, I was lost in this free write and, um, and then I found like something humorous in it. And, um, I can't remember, but, but, uh, I felt like, like I was having fun, like for the first time in a long time, not like, you know, like if you, if you, someone says, oh, you should do this fun thing, like join a fucking men's basketball league. It'll be fun. Well, I didn't think that those things were fun because I was not in a place where anything was fun, but this was actually fun. Not, like, not just like, like if I was in a better place, this would be fun. Like this was like, I'm in, I'm into this. And then when we read them out loud, I was amazed at how funny people were and how quickly these, all of us who were just complete strangers to one another, how vulnerable we got and how, um, and the, and, and I'm guessing all these people thought of themselves as writers. And so everybody had something like kind of poetic to say, <laughs> um, but uh, it was amazing how, how fast we got to know and trust each other. And so um, that's, that's, that was my first experience with it. And then, and then, and then at the, right before lunch that day, that first day, Jory, the teacher came up to me and, and said, um, she, she had told us for what, for the money that you paid to get in this class, um, you can bring three pages of some piece that you're working on hard copy and you can bring a self-addressed stamped envelope and leave it with me on Friday. And, uh, I will put feedback on it and mail it back to you. And she said, do not email me. Oh, I don't like to do feedback that, that way. But, but she said, you know, and, and so, so I was excited about that. And then, and then right at the end of the first morning, when we're getting ready to go for lunch, she comes up to me and says, um, do you, she says, do you have a lot of experience as a writer? And I said, well, I've been writing for 15 years, just in notebooks, just like along with my travels in my, you know, in the military in treatment in, 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 um, alcoholism and, and in Central America. And, but I said, I never had any kind of goal or anything. I just like to do it. And then she said, well, it, it shows. And that was, um, a life changing moment because, and then she said to me, 
um, I'd like to see some of the other stuff that you've written. And she said, you can email me <laughs> your, you know, your stuff. And, and I, so that was like, uh, I haven't thought about this in a while, but that was, that was a, um, maybe the, maybe the best thing that's ever happened to me, you know, because I thought of myself as a failed everything, a failed like military attorney. I used to work in politics and I, and I was 39 or 40 and uh, I had just come back up here and got like a sublet over at Nicollet and 24th. And I just thought like, I haven't done shit, you know, and, but then I thought, okay, so maybe I'm a writer. Maybe what I am is a writer. Uh, and, and then that way, even if I don't ever make any money at it, at least I know what I am and I can make a living doing whatever I have to do. But, uh, if I can just follow this thing, I won't, I just won't feel so lost and, and hopeless, you know? So that's how, that's how I got into it. You said your former position, your former job. What was your former, former job? So, well, this is where, uh, this is, I was, I was talking to Joe on the way over here. Um, uh, I was a prosecutor and, and like, uh, that, that makes for a great story for, for me to then become, to, to do these writing classes in the jail. And it's a true story, but I was a prosecutor for six months. Um, and uh, I was just looking for um, some interest. Like I, I, had, I had gotten sober and finally passed the bar exam. I went to law school way back when I was still like trying to live somebody else's life. Like I have a real influential uncle who had said, you know, you should do, you should get into politics and you should go to law school. And I just, I just thought, well, I don't know what to do. So I'll just do what he says. And then, and then I, I became an addict in law school and, uh, and just barely graduated. And my first job out of law school was, I was like a, a, a bar back at Champs in New Brighton. Like my, like my opinion of myself was, was very low. Uh, but I did get the degree and then I thought like, well, if I can just pass the bar exam, maybe I can get something going, but I failed or bailed out on like four or five, six of these tests through the years and, um, and tried to get into the military thinking that would sober me up. And well, I did get in, but it didn't sober me up anyway. Um, then, then, uh, in sobriety, I did pass the bar exam and uh, I was working for, I was working as a copywriter for a PR firm in Lower Town, St. Paul. And I, I needed something new. And so, so I, uh, uh, this dude at the YWCA where I worked out said he needed a lawyer. And so he said, did you ever pass the bar? And I said, yeah, I did. And so he gave me some money to represent him and I just started up Nate Johnson Law um, thinking I would just learn how to do it. And but I was still I still had a very low opinion of myself. And so I was terrified of everything. You know, I really still wanted to kind of hide from the world. And um, and so I did that job for like six months and made some decent money and did, and did, a, I think a good job for people, but I didn't at the time. Th I just thought it was a fraud, you know? And then this guy that I knew became a judge and he said that he wanted me to clerk for him. So I went and did that for two years in Washington County, just so that I could like not have to deal with, with clients and, and, and not be exposed for like, for not knowing anything, you know, or not being very confident. Um, and I thought like, I can just kick back and make 52 grand a year with benefits in, in, the in the Washington County courthouse and see how all these other lawyers operate. So by the end of that two years, uh, I saw that, that some of these prosecutors seem to be like good, kind hearted people. Some of them weren't, 
a lot of them were not um, and had their own issues. But some of them seemed like they got into it because they wanted to send people like to treatment uh, for mental health or addiction instead of trying to get jail time for everybody. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I could do that because then I don't have to have like clients calling me at 11 o'clock at night and I don't know what to do and I don't know if they're going to pay. And, and like, and so, um, I went down to Waseca County, which was a shithole of a, of a place to work. The, the, every other junior prosecutor had quit over like the last two years because the two women leading the organization hated each other. And actually when I was there, they were, they were running against each other for county attorney. And I was the only other lawyer. And so like, it was the worst place you could set up shop as a, so I, but, but anyway, uh, that's where I had to start because I didn't have any jury trial experience. So nobody in the Metro would, um, uh, hire me. They told me, like I talked to John Choi and he said, you have to go out into rural Minnesota and get some jury trials under your belt. And then you can come back here and talk to us. So that's what I intended to do. Um, and I hated every waking moment of that prosecutor job. Uh, it's not that it wasn't interesting at times. I got to do a couple jury trials, um, you know, but I was still basically like buried in, in shame and like self loathing. I didn't really know it, but I, but I was, you know, and, uh, and I thought like, fuck, you know, I've, I've been sober now for like eight years. Why am I still trying to like, just get numb? Like I had switched from boo, you know, like weed and booze to, to like sugar and porn. You know, but, but it was all for the same, it was still just to pass out, like to just not be, you know, not, not be conscious. And, uh, and I just thought like, is this how everybody feels? Like, like, uh, like, <laughs> and, and so, uh, so I really hit like a new bottom emotionally, um, in, in Wasika, but, but. So it's, so it, what I meant to say, like about how maybe, maybe you had the wrong idea. And I know that like other people like in the media may have the wrong idea and that's okay. Which is like that I was a prosecutor for like 10 years and like had a change of heart and then started helping the people I was putting away. Like that, that is not how it happened. The reason that the prosecutor job was important is because it brought me to um, that part of the state and it brought me and I got myself an apartment in Mankato, which is close to Wasika. And so as a sober person, I was going to AA meetings in Mankato and that's where I met Joe. Um, and uh, um, that and, and it's through him that I found this whole purpose, you know, like, like, um, he, he and I were at a meeting together. Um, I did not care for the AA meetings in that town. It was conserved, like a conservative group of people, um, who didn't really want to get vulnerable, talk about too much. Um, but I just thought like, I don't want to relapse, you know? Um, and so I was going to meetings and, uh, and then one day he shared that he, he had a friend who was just out of detox, I think, or out of the hospital or something who was looking for a sponsor. And he, but he had said in his t talk that he was sober like several months. And I found out later he was on in drug court, in Blue Earth County drug court. Um, and, he, and he said that he was enjoying being sober um, and so I was wondering when he was talking, like, well, why doesn't he sponsor this friend of his? If he, because I, my sponsor had had me start to take on newcomers at about the six month mark, you know, to keep me kind of growing in my recovery. And so, so I went and found him 
after the meeting and said to him, like, why don't you sponsor your buddy? And he said, well, I don't feel ready for that. And I said, all right, well, I could talk to him, um, you know, if you want to put us in touch. And then he said, well, I actually need a sponsor myself. And so I was like, so we went, we went to uh, a coffee shop and uh, I just thought all sober people were coffee drinkers. Um, and so when Joe and I went to this place down on Front Street, uh, I could see he didn't he didn't know anything about coffee because he because he like poured a half gallon of creamer and like a half pound of sugar into this medium coffee just so he could handle it. Uh, anyway, that's not important. Um, I'm kind of trying to make him laugh back there. Um, but uh, uh, but he and I started working together. Well, this this amazing thing happened because because we talked and I was like, well, yeah, let's let's do this, you know, because because I really needed like something real in my own recovery life down there. There was just a hollowness to it. And so I thought like, yeah, if, we, if, if this if this young man and me can um, be in touch, then, you know, and then and then he said, let's go sit out can we go sit outside? And, and we did, and we we're sitting on like this bench or something. And then I think this is right. I, Joe can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the guy who he had referenced in his share pulled up like to the stop, to the stop sign. And, uh, and, and Joe was like, Whoa, wait a minute. And, and so he went up and talked to the guy and I, I didn't really understand it. I'm just sitting there and then he comes back and sits down and we make a plan to whatever, read the big book together. Um, and so, so then, um, him and I were in touch, like, like basically throughout the day, each day. Um, and I found out that he had had a hard upbringing and, um, I don't know if you know, like about like what a fourth step and a fifth step is in, in 12 step program. But, but he came over to my apartment and did his fifth step, which is like where you, the, the fourth step is where you, you take uh, the, the, the phrase is a, a searching and fearless moral inventory. So you're supposed to like make a list of every, everybody and everything that you resent. And, and like, I think like every, everyone you've harmed maybe or something, and then, and then you, and then you say why, and then you talk about like, well, what's your part in this resentment that you can clean up? Like, like, so that you can sort of move forward with a clear conscience. Cause then some of those people that you resent, they would wind up on your eighth step list, which is who you are going to make amends with. And then step nine is to go to those people. So anyway, when he was doing his fifth step, he just completely broke down, you know, and I, and I really respected, like, like he was able to just say, you know, I'm just tired of, uh, of being shit on. And, uh, and so, you know, all I could do was hope that I was like adequate to the task of just like being there and like having something to say or like some, and I, I just used the, you know, the program to try to see what, what we do next. Um, so that, so he and I got really tight and then, and then we started to like deal with life issues and, and then Joe, uh, and then this thing happened. So I quit my job, like, and I had this plan mode to, to just get, to do the same thing that I did when I joined the military, which was to basically tr like try to erase my existence. Um, so I had done some teaching in Honduras uh, before I got sober and I, I felt like I was pretty good at it. And so I thought like, I can, I can just get one of these um, uh, TEFL like uh, uh, ESL, certificates and go and teach English in foreign countries and never come back. Like, 
because I was when I after I quit this job, I was like I had hit hit a new level of shame about like nothing works for me. You know, nothing is. I'm not like equal to any task. Um. <clears throat> so, so I had planned, and I and I told my family like I'm going down to Ecuador. I already had booked a flight, put a down payment on one of these like teaching programs. Um, and, uh, and, and so then I moved back to Minneapolis just for the purpose of like, I was going to spend December up here and just say goodbye to some people. Um, and I told Joe, he, he went to Florida and we lost contact for a while, but then when he came back, he reached out again and I told him like, Hey, listen, I've got some news. I'm going to be down in South America. I could see that he was sad because like. I think he was hoping that we would get to keep, you know, doing this recovery work. And that made an impression on me, but I still, I still thought like, I didn't know that I was running away from anything this time. Well, I kind of did, but I didn't want to admit it. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, so around that time, um, when I was still in Cato, just finishing up my, my sublet, uh, I was like starting to get scared. Like maybe I shouldn't be doing this adventure. Maybe, maybe like, cause I was reading these like Reddit posts of people saying, if you do this in your twenties, it's good. If you do this in your thirties or forties, it's because you're running away. <laughs> and, and like, I was like, fuck. Uh, so, uh, I went and saw this old man named Jim Van Amber, who was actually like a, a retired uh, English teacher and a sober guy in Mankato. Um, and I told him, like, I'm like, Jim, man, I'm like, I don't want to be around people, but I can't stand being alone either. And I don't know what to do. And he knew of a this this uh, a psychoanalyst like a Freudian uh, named named uh, Dr. Alan Serpos at the VA hospital. And he said, Nate, this guy, Dr. Serpos, has really helped me. Jim, um, I don't know whether this is, I should say this, but Jim found out like 25 years into sobriety that he was schizophrenic. And then, um, and then had spent another 25 years treating it and being sober and working with this, Dr. Surpas. And so he said, you can, he, he said, I'll, I'll bet you I could get you in to see him. He said, he's in his early seventies and he's not going to be working that much longer, but maybe you could talk to him before you go to South America. And I got in to see this man and he was the first therapist that I ever trusted, like just right away. And, uh, and he's a dying breed in the sense that nowadays, like, you get your psychiatrist who gives you meds and then your psychologist or your social worker who does talk therapy. But it used to be that the MD psychiatrist psychoanalyst would do both. And that's what he was. And so, uh, so he said to me, um, let's talk and tell me your story. And he said, he said, it sounds like you might have some clinical depression issues. And he said, have you tried medication? And I, I had, but not in sobriety. And I was, I was opposed to that because a lot of this AA shit says that you shouldn't need that stuff. And also I was, um, I would have been embarrassed if my family, like certain family members of mine knew I was on that stuff. And so, uh, but I trusted him and I just said, is there any reason to not do this? You know, and he just said, Nate, do you have a history of seizures? And I said, no. And he said, then no. You, you should. And, and like, and it helped. And like, as soon as this stuff kicked in, I started to have like, I started to kind of like look forward to things like, okay, Christmas is coming. Like, yeah, I like my mom's Christmas Eve church service. I like that choir. And, and I hadn't felt those things before. Uh, and, and so because of that, I decided I don't want to go to South America. Um, I just want to be back in Minneapolis and see what I can get going. 
Um, and so around that time, uh, uh, Joe came up and sometimes he, he had been kicked out of his girlfriend's house and his kid's house and their grandparents. And it was just a whole like dysfunctional thing. And, and so he was trying to stay sober and was kind of split in time between his grandpa's house and his mom's house. And we would get together a lot at my apartment. And one day I brought him with me to a medallion night, which is like where you, sober people get there one year, two year, three year. And I said to him, like, you, you got to get your one year medallion. And he did. And he and he got up and talked about his experience. And he's a real like charismatic guy. And so and so this woman I knew from St. Paul AA came up to him and said, hey, will you speak at our um, at our Woodbury meeting like in a week or two, you know, and he didn't really know what she was asking, but I knew. And as his sponsor, I was like, my job was to say, yeah, he'll do it like, you know, and I think that was a mistake because because he was afraid and um, and he and the night of the meeting in Woodbury, he got there before me and he had so much um um like of a tornado of a life at the time with his kids and his ex and like and um i just thought i didn't know like like because of being as privileged as i am i just thought you know anybody who does anything in in a meeting is, is going to benefit from it um, cause that's what I had been taught. And so, so he got to this and this was at like a Gore, like a, like a Lund's Byerly's in Woodbury. And they had like a community room up on the second floor and it was like just posh suburban. And, uh, um, and he went up there and looked in and the room was packed and he's like, I'm not staying here. I am not staying here. And I told him like, you, you gotta stay, just, I'll be there soon just do like give your talk um and it'll be good you know you can you can trust me and and i got there like you know maybe five or ten minutes late and he was already doing his talk and he was great like like people <laughs> yeah like like when he shared like like his sobriety story and and everything and he got vulnerable and um and then everybody like like uh, just spent the next 20 minutes like clapping for him and then going around telling him how proud they were of him and like how they wish their kid, you know, who has had his drinking problem was that strong. And um, and so I'm just sitting back thinking like, OK, he's he's good now because now he's got all this information from all these people that he's that he's a good man and he's and he's equipped to handle but then that night, um, after we, we went out to pizza and I could just see he was uncomfortable with the whole thing. And I can see now what I couldn't see then, which is that if you spend enough time like I, like I had and like he had just believing that shit really isn't supposed to work out for you, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not easy then if you get like this waterfall of praise from people that you you know you can't relate to or you don't trust you know um and i and i know that feeling like it's you, you like you can try to believe that it's true that you're that you're like adequate or talented or that you're okay but but it, you know and so then that night um well, I just didn't hear from him for a while. And so then, but then he had said like he, he relapsed. I don't, I don't think he drank, but he just smoked some weed. And I mean, and like, so that's not going to get you killed, but, but because he was in drug court, I knew that like, okay, this is gonna, you know, this is going to make it harder to graduate and be off, you know, and be able to like leave Mankato. And, and so, um, yeah, so if I had it to do over, I don't think I would have had him do that Woodbury meeting, you know, because we were we were doing just fine, just the two of us. Um, 
I can't even remember what your question was. No, oh, it's fine. <laughs> this is the last question. Um, I'm gonna call this episode from saving lives from from um, taking lives to saving lives. Okay. Although your prosecution or prosec being a prosecutor uh, role was limited, you still was in that position. So I think that sums up. Because you, I can say it in reference to yourself, or I can say it in reference to the individuals that you yeah. came across. So, how do you feel about that? Well, so here, here's the important thing to understand about like my how this free writers thing came about. Um, now that Joe was like not sober, I knew that he was in danger of like getting in trouble, you know, and and so, so then one day he called me and said that he had been arrested outside of Blue Earth County, which he, which he, and he hadn't told his PO. And so for that, he had to go and do some time in the Blue Earth County Jail. And I went to see him. And by this time, I wasn't the prosecutor anymore, but I had discovered free writing. And, this, and it was helping me tremendously. And so I went to see him, and it was only then that I learned about county jails as opposed to prisons. And I asked him, like I said, I was a lawyer so that they would think I was his lawyer so that they would let me get in there and have a contact visit, like, and, and be able to hug him and like, and just see like how he was doing. Cause I still had my attorney ID and everything. And so, so because of that, I went in there and looked around in the quad and, um, and I asked him, and so he was like, I'll be in here for a couple months. And, and so right away I thought like, okay, um, he had been, he had gotten into therapy and that was, I thought going good. And he, and he and I were still in contact about like recovery. And so I thought like, okay, uh, is this 60 days he has to do going to be a good thing? Cause like he can get, well in here or whatever and then so so then i started asking questions and i was like when do you get to go outside and like get some fresh air take a walk and he said we don't um and i said is there a room in here you can sit in with a window so you can get at least some access to natural light and he said no um and then i said joe is a very bright guy and so i thought like so I was like, well, what about like classroom programming, you know? And he said, there's nothing but like some Bible study and like an NA meeting occasionally. So I, at, in that moment, I was like, okay, this is a place where people come in troubled and get more troubled. Like, like, like you might come in here and then, and then he would tell me like, there's untreated mental illness. And so some dude is screaming all night and he can't sleep. Um, and, uh, and, and this group antagonizes this group over here. And if you were to get into an altercation, you pick up a new charge. And, and I just thought like this fucking place is going to like groom people, <laughs> you know, like people who, who don't have a conviction yet. Um, and so the only thing I could think of to do was to show him free writing. And I just said, uh, I said, this is something I've been doing. I don't know if you'll like it, if, if it'll help, but I'm like, you can sit here like when you're having a tough time. And, and so for the next like six, seven, eight weeks, I would go down there on Saturdays and I would bring stuff that I had written during the week and would read it to him and then he would do the same. Um, and, and then through his writing, I started to feel like I got to know some of the other men in his pod. Um, and then I think, I think toward the end of it, I just said to him, and, and I started to realize like, these are smart people in here um, and creative people. And, uh, and I just thought like, this is a place that's almost like designed to, to, to like, it's like an incubator for social problems and, and, and dysfunction. 
Um, and, uh, and so I asked him, do you think the other guys in here would want to do this writing? And he said, yeah, he's like, yes. And I had a connection from back in my law and politics days. I knew a guy who worked in the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office on the civilian side who could get me a meeting with their jail programming uh, sergeant. So I could pitch this idea of teaching free writing up here downtown Minneapolis in the Hennepin County Jail. Um, and I thought that being that, that like Hennepin County is like a progressive, diverse county that I thought that they would tell me like, we've got wall to wall programming. Um, but it was no, no better than Lures. It was the same thing, no windows, no time to get outside and nothing to do but, but go to Bible study and, and, and an AA meeting. Nothing against those two uh, things, but, and so, so that's, so then I, they let me try it once and it was a hit right away. And like the deputy who escorted me up and down just said, man, I've been working here like 12 years and I've never seen a response like that to a, to like a program, like a volunteer program. Okay. But hold up, I got something to say. back. This is IGSTS. You're in a grill pit. I'm SF Moe, your prison lawyer, and I have two guests with me today. Um, can you introduce yourself, starting with you, Nate? Yeah, I'm Nate Johnson. I'm Joe. Welcome to IGSTS. Um, the conversation, if you already <laughs> heard, uh, Nate was talking about the county jail system. Um, and what we're trying to do is just establish the fact that when people come into the county jails, um, what they experience, you know, um, whether it be mental health illness, whether it be the criminal conviction itself, whether it be criminal conviction itself, whether it be going through the system, not knowing how the system works, um, it is a depressing situation. Mm -hmm. Would you say that being in county jail? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, yeah anybody can answer. Okay. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I mean, you don't go to jail to have fun. So, I mean, but either way, it's a, it's a place, yeah, where Nate was like saying it's more of an incubator. Like you go in there not knowing shit and you learn about some shit you had nothing about and walk out with more plugs than you walked in out with. You know what I mean? I don't know. You know what I mean? He was, he was also talking about how it is a place where you can come in fighting a charge and get an additional charge because they start charging for fights, for drugs, for whatever you might, contraband you might bring in, they start charging on the streets. Yeah. Now, have you, did you see a lot of that in county jail? Well, yeah, I mean, either way too, like you're locked up, you know what I mean, with, with people that done some shit to some kids, you know what I mean? You touch anyone like that, it's a hate crime and a whole bunch of other stuff it just transpires, you know what I mean? like. Even before you get to the joint, you know what I mean? You deal with this shit in county too, long before you, you know what I mean? It's just the food. I just noticed like the food is is the worst food you could actually eat in your life. Everything's super expensive from the telephone calls to the canteen because you have to have canteen because the food doesn't fill you up. I mean, it's just, it's just to my, my position has always been if you're innocent until you're proven guilty, why am I being treated like an animal? Right. You know, why am I not being treated like a citizen without, when I still have the rights of a citizen? And they never can be able to explain that to me. Like, why am I, why are these conditions so deplorable? Why can these guards strip search me and do whatever they want to do with me in the name of security when I haven't done anything wrong yet? I haven't been convicted. Right. Did you feel like that when you were in county? Well, I mean, that's... Yeah, you're guilty until proven innocent. Right. It's just, 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 yeah. how, just how I felt. Um, Can I say something, Jerome? Go ahead. Um, one thing I want to make sure to get 
in um, in the discussion is that uh, you know, like how when I said when I came to Hennepin County to the Hennepin County Jail and and found that they didn't really have much for a creative arts programming yeah. either. Yeah. Um, I I don't want to give the impression that there's nobody in this city who cares about uh, people locked up in. I mean, obviously, you and I would not even have met if it wasn't for Jen right. and the Prison Writers Workshop. But what what I came to understand after doing this work for a while is that is that if if people want to teach a curriculum like a like a writing curriculum it's not really possible to do it in the jail because there's a lot of turnover correct yes so so like i didn't even know when we started free writers that the fact that you can do it like if you do it one time like what had happened to me it can wake something up in you where you just realize like okay i'm a human being um i you know I've got <laughs> hopes and dreams and, and, and value. Uh, and I'm, maybe I'm a decent writer. Maybe I'm a decent, um, uh, communicator. Um, and, and so if, if free writers was something where you had to do it for 10 weeks to get right. the benefit of it, right. it wouldn't work in jail either. Like that's why MPWW as much as I'm sure Jen and Mike would love to help the people in jail, right? You just don't know, like if the average stay is a couple weeks, two, three, four weeks. Uh, but what's really fucked up about that is that if you're in there like fighting a charge and you don't have any money to bail out, you can be in there for like two years. Yeah. So so like so like this is. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I just want to say like we, we, the free writers thing, we, we were lucky to have found a method that can work in an environment where there's turnover like this. And we hope that that we can get more of it in there. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why people have to sit in jail and just stew in anger and depression is because some of the well-meaning writing teachers up to now didn't have didn't really have a way to come in and like uh, uh, facilitate something well I wanted uh, to facilitate my, something well I wanted to my conversation is beyond writing because I believe that because the county jail is a place where people are on their last effort to correct their lives their lives is in shambles for right. whatever reason right. Ad addiction you know because they're economic issues or just right. they're just delusional um, but it, to me, it's always been, I had a guy tell me in county, why aren't we, that's in county who has done 27 years. He asked a question and I was speechless because it was just ground shaking. And like, we're talking around the subject. The subject is, is if the community is in need of help because that's where you get, that's where you get the county jail. Right. And then if you come in with something as small as writing, right. something as simplex as writing and give a person confidence and you can change their lives. With that, why aren't we talking about more programming, more efforts to get social programming yeah. into the county jails right. where we can actually help people where if they're their last this effort, whether it might be, you know, substance abuse, where there might be just a therapy with the family, trying to keep the family connected. Right. I mean, why aren't we talking about those things? Well, and you're not in there for very long if you have money. No, you're not. You know, because I mean, unless you unless you just Unless you did something, Heinous. you know, like for most people, you're in there because you are, you come from poverty. Right. And so, and so like, yeah. So for the, for the, for the audience, like if you, if you, if you come from like a middle-class background and you get a DWI or you commit domestic assault or you sell drugs and you, and you can afford to post bail. Yeah. You don't have to be in there, uh, and you don't need a free writer's class. No, you don't. Um, but but like what I found out is everybody who's in there de is dealing with poverty. Right. That's a that's the underbelly of, and that's what I mean by coming into that conversation with the person right now, whether 
they're they're vulnerable and they're willing to listen. Right. Because I mean, of course, I mean, if I was in county jail and you brought free riding to me, of course, I would want to get out the cell. Right. First and foremost, because right. I was in Kennepin County on my violation, my account, my account, my uh, actual charge came from Anoka County. Now, Anoka County does when I was in there about 15, 18 years ago, I went back for I went back on my violation, but they sent me to the workhouse and they sent me to county jail. I heard it was worse. But when I was in there because they had federal inmates in there, mm. they had a GED program. Mm. They had a drawing program. Mm. They had several for the federal inmates because they were able to utilize that as ways to get their time cut. So they had to have the program. Okay. Okay. So it was available. Some things were available, like the library was available to available to me in Anoka County, mm -hmm. which wasn't available to me. I saw it when I went to prison, but mm -hmm. I was locked up in Rice County and all it was in Rice County because it's close to Blue, Blue, Blue Earth. Mm -hmm. All it was was some TV, mostly locked down, mm -hmm. mostly just sleeping, mostly just being depressed. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that would exacerbate any mental illness right. you would have. Right. Right. I mean, it's hard to stay sober and like and, 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 and battle depression, even if you have everything going for you, you know, like and then and then you and then you get stuck in a fucking <clears throat> fluorescently lit room 24 seven. Yeah. Like like so. And so I just don't I just don't really feel like people know that. Yeah. Would would you say like. Prior to you, I would say, besides the substance abuse, I'm in contact with Joe. Just did it? Did you have a form? Did you formulate an opinion uh, about the individuals being locked up? Did you have a general opinion of individuals? Well, yeah. I mean, I had well, no. What, what was it? Well, I mean, I had no connection. So, so I'll tell you, like, I I would have thought coming from like a white town, like rural white town, middle class. Um, I would have thought that to go in and lead a writing class would be dangerous. Why? Because, because I because I thought is... I thought that people who were locked up are violent people. Well, even as a prosecutor, did you think that? Now you now, this is before is this before you became a prosecutor? You thought that? Well, it's so so in Waseca County. This is like a this is like a, a rural county. So like the people coming through the county attorney's office, these are like local people with DUIs. Yeah. Domestic yeah, violence. Yeah. And so small petty things. Yeah. And and you would know them like the like some dude that sells meth and 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 everybody knows it. And and so Waseca County was very much like the the county that I grew up in where it's like ninety nine percent white people or ninety four percent white people or whatever and um and not like if you grow up like I did, you have this sense that like in the metro, um, it's different, you know, because of the diversity, or yeah. because or what you see on TV, yeah, TV, TV, just like, basically ignorance because you don't know anybody, right? You're just seeing being programmed. I saw like my introduction to non-white culture was um, Snoop and Dre videos <laughs> in, in like in the early '90s. Like me, me and my friends were big fans and like. NWA. Well, I was a little bit younger than that. Um, like when I was when I was in seventh grade, we moved to a big enough town where we had cable, and then we had MTV. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, nothing but a G thing. Yeah. Was was on this like top ten. Yeah. Every day on MTV, and so me and my friends all loved the song, and we all bought the CD. And then I saw Boys in the Hood, you know, and like that. That was that was the thing I knew and then and then athletes well and musicians too so so that that's my my deal with uh, and I'm and I, and I met a gentleman and that you mentioned something early in your your narrative about you know about being a prosecutor and how you were only a prosecutor for six months and it's not as though I had this long history where I could go back and I could say that I'm I'm actually trying to clean up my wrongs because the things I've done, I'm trying to save these people. And the gentleman I spoke to, and I want to say what's up with Phil, and thank you for watching, Phil. It's nice meeting you. I talked to you today, my ride in. Um, and thank you for this thought, um, uh, is that 
when it comes to him, when people say what he's doing is a civic individual and they say you're paying, you're paying back. He's like, I'm never paying back because I've never taken away. I'm just giving. Mm. So what you're doing right now is giving. Right. Because you've never taken anything from the system at all. You never you never it was this prosecutor was hard nosed, giving people life without parole. No. You never was that individual. But you did see that it was a it was a it was a it was a miss. Something was missing. Something was needed. And you you came back and survived. I mean, I wish I could say more that that was true. Um, it just it, it the the connection for me, like was was really just Joe because. Okay, so I'll just be really honest with you. So, so if you grow up like I did, and you, and you see a young black man, um, who who like grew up selling drugs, yeah, and like had been had been like involved in violence, yes, um, like I I had never personally known anybody like that, and so I would have thought there's nothing that 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 he and I can relate about, right. Okay. Um, and so Joe was like my bridge into like a world other than the one that I knew. It wasn't like I was like, uh, like, like, um, uh, like resented any, any other culture. Um, I just had preconceived notions from whatever the media, I, I, I definitely grew up in a racist, um, home Mm -hmm. and town. So was it just racist as, um, epithets being hurdled yeah or, yeah yeah like not like 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 not my mom so much but my dad like like if you're if you're like a if you're just like a regular guy in the 80s and 90s i don't know how it is now in small town usa um you know it's like this this poison you don't even know like racist jokes and like and like it's just part of being like six years old and hearing somebody right. tell a joke and and so um my dad was not did not have like the the strength or the integrity to like identify that and 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 say this is um this is evil you know or like 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 this is uh and and to and to show me like okay we do not we do not promote this kind of thing. And so I didn't, I didn't grow up like to, to go out and hate people. Um, but I grew up around people who made comments like racist comments right. and things like that. Well, yeah. And, and so, um, so when Joe and I got connected, um, you know, and his dad, um, what is involved, was involved in organized crime and he had done time and, and his mom had done time. And so I just thought, and yet, and yet my introduction to him was what he had to say in that AA meeting. And he just sounded like a dude, like, like a 25 year old, uh, you know, uh, who, who like needed a sponsor. Um, so, so, so once I, once I understood like, okay, he's just a, a young man that grew up in West St. Paul. Um, and, and this is how he had to make a living. And this is how he had to uh, uh, be social, mm-hmm. you know, and like and deal with the trauma from from his folks issues. Then I realized, OK, it is not OK that people get fed into like the wood chipper. Right. Like this. Right. You know, right. And, and all of a sudden I can see like we, we have a whole like I don't know what you want to say, like community of people, class of people. Yeah. Who, who people like me, like my father, like my grandfather, um, just don't have time for. Right. You know, and we don't want to hear it if, if like someone says, oh, we need, we need like better treatment. Like, like we, we just, all we, all we have to do is just flip on like, like uh, uh, conservative talk, talk radio yeah. and, 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 and then, and someone will say, uh, slavery is over, right? And and I never and I never owned a slave, right? So what are you bothering me right. about about this, right? Um, and and so I didn't really have a way to see that. Um, oh, I just think I think it's been 
Yeah, the reason why I have, I got something to say. The reason why we're the voice of the voiceless is because this narrative has been muddled, has been pushed down, and they don't want you to talk about it because we can make inroads, right? If you can connect with Joe, someone you in a million years, you probably would never come across, you know what I'm saying? And have you guys bond become excellent friends, best of friends, mm -hmm. and um, and you to identify with him and and actually be his support and him be your support, then I'm saying this might be a social construct for society. Right. If you can do it, coming from where you're coming from and where Joe's coming from, you guys can come to come together and find some commonality. Why can't we all do it? Right. Why can't we look past you know economic, social right. situations? Well, and one thing that made it easier for him and, and me to connect was that um, Joe's grandpa is a rural white dude, like from from the Iron Range, and he and so Joe grew up doing some of the things that I did, like hunting and fishing, um, and uh, and I met his grandpa like when he was kind of couch surfing. Um, uh, I would go over and hang out with his grandpa, and and so his his grandpa adopted Joe's mom, who's native. Okay. Um, and so Joe actually had had his grandpa. Uh, I think kind of saved him from foster care, and raised him. And so Joe had access to white culture, like rural white culture. Um, I mean, he wouldn't have known that that's what it was at the time, but like, and so. Uh, so he and I did actually have some things in common in terms of how we were brought up. Okay. You know, uh, Joe, I got a, a, a couple of shows coming on where I'm going to talk about adoption and a couple of different things. Would you be interested in talk, telling your story um, in regards to that? I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but I am putting you on the spot because I think that conversation has been missed also. I mean, I mean, he wasn't adopted. Yeah, I wasn't adopted personally, but... Yeah, like my, like you said, kind of my mom just went in to, yeah, basically my gramps took us in, me and my sister, so we didn't have to go to uh, adoption, you know. Do you know how your grandpa decided to adopt your mom? Like, like that's what I, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, the conversation yeah, has always um, been, it's, it's always been the, the natives being adopted by Caucasian individuals. It's been a big, like they would take those children specifically, you know, as infants and bring them into their household. And that assimilation in itself is, is, is you know, because they're missing all the, the native culture. Right, you miss all your culture. You, yeah. so, but they had, a, they had a big, I've read law reviews about it. I've seen mm -hmm. um, um, a lot of different conversation about that that was the not, the pat, they would not put them in native homes. They would specifically put them in white homes. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and it's funny that you happen to come through that. And that's the commonality between yourself right. and Nate, just that background. Um, did you? I'm not saying that that's the reason that we. No, no, I'm just saying, but, it, but, just, it, but it, it is, it's a historical in Minnesota no, I history. What you're saying. In, I it's what in you're saying. And yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah, I wouldn't have a problem. I wouldn't have a problem speaking out. Great, I thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to that to that conversation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But um, just back to um, the other thing that I really wanted to talk to you about, and I think that is missed. Is mental health because mm -hmm. you talked to me about you opened up to me about that. I'm not sure how much how open you're going to get to our viewers about your. I, but I think you can help them by talking about your maybe maybe the whole um, use of drugs was self medication yeah, at the time absolutely. for what you were dealing with. Can you talk a little bit more about that for me? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, I mean, when I first got when I first tried. Um, medication for depression and it helped I started to wonder like would I have ever even become an alcoholic addict if if when I, you know if there wasn't so much stigma when I was in my early 20s I was in law school when um when the shit really started to like like my my family issues like uh my, my, I didn't I didn't grow up in like a completely stable home um either and so some of some of those um i don't know what what how to say it like some of those potholes started to like be an issue for me in my early to mid 20s and so that's when i started 
smoking weed. Like I, I basically just smoked weed around the clock as an anti-anxiety medication. Man, it's so, 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 yeah. so, so have you have, are you, so once you were diagnosed with mental illness, did that make things more clearer to you? Well, it didn't, ha it didn't happen for me. Yes, it did. But like, we're talking like late thirties. Right. So like, I come across, but the whole time you knew something was wrong. I did, but I didn't know, like, like you don't, if you, if you grow up thinking like, well, I should be just a little bit ashamed of like seeking like mental health counseling or medication. Uh, I, I spent like my whole twenties, thirty most of my thirties thinking like, no, you know what? I'll just pray more. I'll just meditate more. I'll just exercise more. Is that the family that's making you feel ashamed that Fa you, you think that Fa family? And, and, and I also like sober culture. Like there's a, there's like a, um, a rigid strain of Alcoholics Anonymous that says that if you're depressed, it's a spiritual okay. thing. Um, and I don't, I don't like that's what those people think, you know, I mean, they're not doctors, so they probably shouldn't say that, but, but, you know, so, so yeah, I, I always just thought like, well, I'll just exercise more. I'll just try to get more sunlight, you know, and then it wasn't until like, I kind of hit another bottom in my, when I was almost 40 that I realized. Yeah. And I think that's good. To, at least you came to the realization and you're here to talk about it. Um, and that's very important. Uh, because we are the voice of the voiceless and um, conversations like that need to be had um, more about the free writing before we, before we break um, the free writing. Now that happens every other Thursday. Well, it happens. It happens um, eight times a week in the jails, in the jails and which jails are they again? We, we do six free writers classes a week in Hennepin County. We do one free riders class a week in Anoka County and one in Wright County in Buffalo. Why not Ramsey County? They just haven't been interested. Like we, I've, I've reached that's, out to that's, them. That's that's funny that they wouldn't yeah. because they they have a deplorable jail also. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like yeah. I've tried everything. And uh, what what has been the, the reasons that what's been the denial? They like, just have said. I mean, you know, anybody during COVID could say that. Yeah, we were blanketing um, COVID across. But there. then, even when it was over, um, I just kept hitting dead ends. They would say, "Nate, we don't have time to meet with you this week. We'll let you know." I would follow up. I wouldn't hear anything. It must just be some. I mean, I don't know. I don't Are know you hoping through evidence based, uh, just to show them the connectivity you have, that individuals positive. Are you looking to show a track record so you can bring back to more counties and have this be, uh, are you looking to expand outside of Minnesota? Just like have this be, like MPWW to me is in Minnesota, but there's writing workshops yeah. across the nation in prison. Yeah. Are you looking at like that for county jails? Yeah, I, I really like, I I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't want to jinx it, but I really feel like this thing is going to blow up. Moment. There's no there's no jinxing because I, I came to writing through MPWW, became a better writer. Like the writing helped me through my college career, right. helped me um, express a lot of anger, a lot of depression I had while I was in prison. Right. It was when I was getting locked down. It was a way for me to ex expand my cell and get out of my cell. Right. So it's it's not it's not a fad. It's not anything like that. It's just something that people need to understand. It well, works. Right, but and the and the thing that the, the reason that I don't like I don't worry anymore about really anything like as far as my career mm. because because the thing that I just have not yet had time to educate the public on that I only just like found out thanks to Joe and like by accident is that um in the in these pretrial jails, um, you've got poor people who grew up hard, um, who some, mo many of whom have not yet made like really crucial decisions about what path they're going to take. Right, um, and they sit in there with no natural light and no access to like wellness. Exactly. Except for some push-ups they can do. Somebody comes in and teaches a yoga class. Maybe. So, you know, um, and and so, and so, like I said, it's not because nobody cares. I mean, 
there are people who don't care, but there are people who also who do care, but they had not yet figured out like a tool to go into those facilities and reach those people who are right there at this crossroads. Mm -hmm. And and free writing is like the, like the exercise itself is the star of the show. Like like you can't even help but like get vulnerable and learn things about yourself. And so um so if we can get this in, I mean, I don't know for a fact, but I'm guessing that in LA County, Cook County, yeah. Illinois, yeah. you know, I, hey, County. I'll bet you, yeah. I'll bet you, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like right now there's a 19 year old man, mm -hmm. young man mm -hmm. who is like, you know, does not have a felony to his name yet, maybe, right. which means that he's not like completely fucked in terms of getting an apartment right someday or like job a job yeah and and that young man is not does not know the extent of his talents right um the extent of of like the help that he needs for for tr trauma that he's experienced um and and so that young man is about to make a decision basically to this is where like my knowledge of, of some of this stuff kind of ends, but like, I just have the impression that, um, there are a bunch of people who, who could use a reminder that you might not have to go into a line of work where you're going to catch a felony. Right. Um, and once, and, and so, so these County jails are places that like basically guarantee. Yeah because your, your, your trauma is going to get worse. Right. Your opinion of yourself is going to get lower. Exactly. Um, and so and you're around all these individuals who are telling you that somehow this makes sense. Right. Probably start to think you deserve. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You just, I mean, easy, you know, when you, when you, when you, it's just, it's a, it's, so to go from County jail, to go to college, to go to the workforce, to go. We, I, I was again. I was talking to a gentleman at the smoke shop. We talked about community, right. um, and then you find yourself identifying with communities, um, opposed to being in a hood or being um, in his in his projects or whatever it is. Because once you start to associate yourself with certain certain words, then the, the words in themselves become who you think you are. Right. So I think the, the biggest thing I had when it came to writing, because I've always had thoughts in my head um, that I wanted to get out, was just reading my writing out right. to the public, actually reading my thoughts, actually having people identify or, or clap or or that that affirmation, that validation um, made me who I am now. Mm -hmm. You know, because I don't I think my conviction is what made me who I am, mm -hmm. you know, because I went through that trial. And I think that free writing, um, writing in general, because um, free writing is I've never been a fan of free writing, mm -hmm. um, but it's always been it's always something I've been productive in. Yeah. I just don't have I just hate being told I have to write something. Yeah. But when you when you when you get the prompt and you write, it just things just start to flow out. Right. You know, well, and, and, and an important thing about so. So like, you know, what what proper writing workshops do is. um like I salute anybody who, who runs a, a writing workshop where a writer, where an artist can come in and workshop a piece of writing and get feedback and yeah. improve and revise. So that's, that's, I mean, I, as a writer am involved in those groups and it's crucial to my development as a writer. Free writing is different. You can, you can come in to a free writers class in the jail reading at a second grade level. Mm -hmm. And it's not about becoming a better writer. It's about, the emotional release. And so, so you, some of the best, if you want to call like, <clears throat> if you want to call a five minute free write a poem, which it, which you can, sure. some of the best poems I've heard are from people who are functionally illiterate because it's simple. Mm -hmm. You know, I am scared, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 God, where are you? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and so the crucial thing about this method is that you don't really have to be, you don't have to know how to spell anything, right, right. punctuate, just conscious. And that's what I did. See, that's the difference in your class. I've been to your class a couple of times and, um, I've never 
being a free writer who wrote present, always wrote thoughts. Right. So uh, what I mean by present, you would write what I feel right now. Right. I've never wrote like that. And that was interesting, as I said in your class, because I heard names that people are in the room. I heard um, how I'm feeling right now, right. what I'm doing right now. And I think that presence of writing is crucial because it makes you assess yourself right. at that moment and, and be vulnerable. Tell, tell individuals how you feel. Never looked at writing like that. Right. And that's what your class has given to me because now I've started to write a little bit more conscious of my surrounding. And when you when I feel like I don't have anything to write, I'll just write what I feel right now. Yep. Yep. Which And when you share it and you find that people don't don't hate you <laughs> for getting vulnerable, it's an it's an important it's a, it's a it's a positive support. And so to to so like when you said Mo, you said you do this every other Thursday. That's we do the we do the post incarceration every other every Thursday. every other Thursday. And where is that at? That's at the Plymouth Congregational Church in South Minneapolis. And at what time? It's at from six to eight p.m. every other Thursday night. So we just did one on January fifth. So for anyone who's who's watching, if you just do the math. Mm -hmm. um, we just leapfrog over. So, soon we'll be doing more of these, but right now we do eight classes a week in the jails and and two classes a month at the church. What to talk about that 20, Jan, uh, January 25th event you had? Oh, yeah. And we'll just close on that. Okay, okay. So I've had some really good people um, who've seen the media exposure that we've gotten, like retired professionals come and want to help me with uh, like fundraising and, and like leadership and management. So these people have formed a development committee and they and the chair of that committee, a, a really lovely person named Norma Borland, she said, we need to have a public event um, and we need to invite um, whoever we can invite who needs to know about this and we need to thank invite the people who, who have already supported us and thank them. And so, and, and Emily Hunt Turner, who runs a restaurant and a, and a, um, and a, like a civil rights social justice organization called All Square, she has donated the space for us at 6 p.m. on January 25th. Um, she's gonna serve up some of her famous grilled cheese sandwiches and chocolate chip cookies we're going to do some free writing. Uh, I'm going to talk about the origin of free writers. Uh, we're going to have a gentleman, Victor, who was there the other night. Yeah, He's Victor. going to get up and read. Um, and so it's going to be the first chance that the public will have to kind of come and find out. Kind of like what, what you know, Jen and, and every, like what they do. We've never had like an event like that where we can come. You can come and donate money, and you can come and learn more. And so, you think this is going to be something annual? Well, it will be. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the purpose of this January twenty five thing, according to to our fundraising chair Norma, is we want to be able to like, she's calling it a friend raiser, where it's like, if we if we break even, that's okay, as long as people then go out and host these get togethers in, in their, among their networks. Um, and so, so we will eventually have an annual like I event. This is not really that this is like the beginning of like uh, grassroots mm -hmm. developing our grassroots support. Um, we, we just haven't had time yet and we don't have like the resources yet to put on like a big BMPWW. Yeah, yeah. But, but someday. Yeah. I want on, on the record, this is the last thing I'm going to ask you, is can I come and read on the 25th? You got Victor coming. Can I read? Yes, you can. Yes, you, you can. You got it. Hey, you, you got it. I thought it's, you were going to be shooting. I will be shooting, but I want to come up and read. Okay, too. yeah, yeah. I will be shooting also. Yeah, we would be honored. All right. I want to thank you um, <sighs> uh, for coming over and talking with me. I appreciate you. It was great meeting you. I appreciate Jen for the connect between the two. Uh, like Joe. It's cool. Yeah. Took him to the took him home the other night. It's all good. Mm -hmm. And uh I want this friendship to flourish. Mm -hmm. And it's great. I love free writing. I love writing in general. And I think you're doing a great job, man. Thank you, Appreciate man. you. Appreciate you too. We're out of here. All right. All righty. Thank you. Woo.